Welcome on students. Today we're going to do our chapter 14 test study guide. So hopefully you had a nice weekend and we are now beginning the week of April 27th of our virtual class. So uh, please uh, have your study guide with you. I'm going to go through, explain. You probably want to pause the video, fill in your study guide with some key notes, uh, vocabulary. There is a number of problems as you've looked at on this, so I'm going to work these out. You may want to pause the video, uh, try these problems on your own, and then check your answer. Uh, I am planning to send a link out uh, later today uh, to invite those who would like. It's not mandatory, but uh, for a live uh, Zoom to field some questions uh, for this particular test. Now. When I field the questions, we're not going to, it's not going to be drawn out to two, three hours. It's going to be about 30 to 40 minutes. I'll answer direct questions. We can look at some of the problems that I did here with you uh, on this uh, study guide. So please don't forget the test is on Wednesday. So you have today and tomorrow to go through the study guide, uh, prep yourself, look back on your uh, worksheets that you turned in. I annotated all of them. So you should be able to go in there and see why you missed something. And uh, that hopefully will uh, be of help to you. So let's get started on this. All right, number one, what is compressibility? It is a measure of how much the volume uh, of matter, a measure of how much the volume of matter decreases under pressure. So think about uh, if you talk about a liquid. Now you know there's particle attraction, so the particles flow, which means they can move past each other, which there's not a lot of room to compress at that point. So liquids and solids are not compressible under normal means. But when you talk about a gas and there is no particle attraction, so there's lots of space, they are easy to compress. So that's compressibility. So because of that large amount of space, they can be pressed closer together. Number two, be familiar with the kinetic theory of gas. So you've heard me mention that just a second ago, but there's no particle attractions. So there's a lot of space between the molecules and they're moving constantly, rapidly, and random in all directions. And everything it strikes, it is saving the kinetic energy. So it's perfectly elastic. So that is the kinetic theory of gas. And it relates to really everything that we were talking about within this section. Number three, Boyle's law. So now we're gonna start our first gas law, Boyle's law. For a given mass of gas at constant temperature, the pressure varies inversely uh, with the volume. So let's, let's think about that for a second. And that's how we derive our formula, which you already have. So please, uh, hopefully you have printed that uh, formula sheet. That's really important and you should have that handy. So here we have our PV equals uh, P2V2. And the volume varies inversely with the pressure. So let's look here at a pressure volume graph. So I'm just going to put a graph here just like so. And I am going to put pressure and volume. And when I say it, it's inverse related. So you're going to have a graph that looks something like that. So as I restrict the volume, I compress it. So my volume gets smaller, my pressure goes up. So as my volume gets larger, my pressure falls. And as my volume gets smaller, my pressure goes up. So that is an inverse relationship. And this is what the graph looks like. It's a curved line. So now when we talk about Charles's law, Charles's law is volume to temperature. So the definition, once again, these are definitions. Charles's law the volume of a fixed mass of gas is directly proportional to its Kelvin temperature if the pressure is held constant. So that's how we get V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. And once again, 
I have right here this formula for you. You don't have to memorize it. It is on that formula sheet, and you'll be allowed to use that on your test on Wednesday. But one of the key takeaways, please remember, the temperature must be Kelvin. It has to be Kelvin. If it's not Kelvin, then you will not get the right answer. On the worksheet, I notated that on a lot of students. Uh, I circled their Celsius temperature in the formula and made note that you had to get to Kelvin. So how do you get to Kelvin? So Kelvin equals your degrees Celsius plus 273, very important. Should know that, should master that concept right there. All right, so how does a volume temperature graph look? So if I come over here and I just plot down a volume to temperature, I'm gonna have a straight line. So as I increase my temperature, my volume is going to increase. As I decrease the temperature, the volume will uh, decrease. So it's directly proportional. And this is as long as I hold the moles and the pressure constant. So it's a straight line graph. So if I look at a pressure temperature, I'm gonna put my graph right here, and I have my pressure and my temperature. Once again, it is a straight line graph. As my temperature goes up in Kelvin, the pressure is going to go up if we are holding the volume. So think about, we have a said volume, say a five liter tank, and we increase the temperature, what we've done is increase the kinetic energy of the gas. So now it's moving more rapidly and striking more often. So that increases the pressure. So that is the graph. So we have two straight line graphs, Charles Law and Gay-Lussac's Law. And we have a curve, and that is Boyle's Law. So now speaking of that, let's talk about Gay-Lussac's law. The pressure of a gas is directly proportional to the Kelvin temperature if the volume remains constant. And here, once again, is your formula for that. P1 over T1 equals P2 uh, over T2. From that, we can derive the combined gas law. So the combined gas law, P1, V1, T1 equals P2, V2, T2. So is used in a changing environment when the only thing you have constant is the amount of gas, the moles, the amount of particles is held constant. But you can now calculate any of those variables, pressure, volume, or temperature in a changing environment using the combined gas law. Number nine is an ideal gas. So an ideal gas is a gas that follows all of the principles of the kinetic theory of gas. So it follows everything, no particular attraction. Each individual uh, particle has no said volume in and of itself, and it's moving constantly, rapidly, and random. That is an ideal gas. Let's move this sheet up a little bit more. Does an ideal gas really exist? No, it doesn't. However, we can set up situations in that it will act, a gas will act like an ideal gas. So what are those? And these are really important right here. A gas behaves most like an ideal gas at high temperatures and low pressure, high temperatures and low pressure. When you talk about that, there is no chance because there's not a lot of pressure and the temperature is high, so the gas are moving very fast. There's no time for London dispersion forces to form. And you guys remember what London dispersion forces are. That's where you have momentary uh, polarity based on the movement of electrons. So you'll have a slight delta positive and a slight delta negative, and then you can have some attractions that take place. And uh, when the temperature is high and there's low pressure, you can't get that to form. So that is an eye attack gas. However, think about the second part here on this one right here. A gas behaves least like an ideal gas at low temperatures and high pressure. So what are you doing? You are forcing the gases close to each other and now they're not moving as fast. So now you could have London dispersion forces take place. And this is why sometimes under high pressure gases condense. Form in a liquid, and then when you do your ideal gas law, you don't get the right pressure 
the pressure is lower than what you expected. Why? Because now some of the gas is gone. It condensed into the liquid state. So real key concept there. Number 11, our ideal gas law. So we have PV equals NRT. The easiest way to identify this is if you are dealing with moles, amount of a gas, you have to use the ideal. It's the only one that has moles in it. Now, uh, pretty straightforward calculations. Uh, most students had no issue with this. The only thing you have to do is be able to know which R value to use. Now, remember, the R value is the ideal gas constant. And we talked a little bit about how it was derived. Uh, the important aspect is to know which one you're going to use. So if you are dealing with atmospheres or the pressure is asked for in atmospheres, you have to use this one right here, 0 0.0821. You've got to use that one. And it's atmospheres times liters over mole kelvins. If, however, you want kilopascals, or you're given kilopascals, then you have to use 8.31, and that one is kilopascals times liters over Kelvin moles. So, real important, and please make sure that's written down handy for you on your formula sheet. You don't have to memorize it, you just have to be able to know which one you have to use. So there is more R values in this. There's one for Tor as well, but I'm not gonna worry about that. We will not be using that particular one. Number 12, how do you convert grams to kilograms of a substance? So sometimes you will have a question that might ask you about grams, number of grams, they might say you have two kilograms. Well, you have to know a thousand grams is a kilogram. So please, that, we've done that earlier in the year. Uh, I don't want to belabor that, but just please remember that. And we already talked about a really important concept, and that was converting Celsius to Kelvin. Sometimes you might have to convert Kelvins back to Celsius, but it's a simple. It's all about that 273. So if you have to go to Kelvins, so we already said this once, but just because it's so important, is Celsius plus 273. And if you want to go to cell Kelvins, Celsius from Kelvin, sorry, you go Kelvin's minus 273, and that gives you your degrees Celsius. That's the degrees sign right there. So please don't forget that. All right, number 13, we have Dalton's law of partial pressure. So at constant volume and temperature, the total pressure is the sum of all the partial pressures of the component gases. That's the definition. So what's the formula? It's right here. It's pressure total equals pressure partial plus pressure partial plus pressure partial. It doesn't matter how many. It could be two, three, four, six. doesn't matter. However many gases, it's a mixture. Remember, it's not a chemical reaction, just like air around us. It's just there. It's the gases that are there. Uh, and you add up all of those uh, pressures. And we did a little bit of example problems in that particular uh, PowerPoint virtual lesson. So let's keep moving down here. Number 14, be able to calculate partial pressures of total pressure given basic information. So I have a couple little things here we'll look at. So example, so you have five moles of a gas and 20 atmospheres. What happens if you cut the gas back to 2.5 moles? Well, it's directly proportional. So the thought process of this, you're not really given the partial pressures, but you can easily calculate that. So five moles of a gas is 20 atmospheres. You cut it back to 2.5 moles. That means you halved the moles, you halved the gas pressure. So you are now at 10 atmospheres of pressure. So this is just a little twist because we've done some problems in the virtual lesson where we're dealing straight with partial pressure given to us or total pressure and then calculating partial pressures of different gases. But I wanted to just do a uh, little bit of a difference where I'm actually telling you uh, moles and talking about the pressure because moles is directly proportional to the pressure. So look at the next one here. It says uh, two gases each with two moles for a total pressure of 10 atmospheres. So I have two different gases and two moles. So that means total pressure is 
I mean, sorry, the total moles is four moles and 10 atmospheres. What is the partial pressure of each? What is the partial pressure of each? So now with that being said, uh, we can say that each gas is contributing a partial pressure of 10. How do I know that? Because there's two gases and they have the same number of moles each. So uh, that would be 10 divided by two is five. So five atmospheres. So that is what the thought process is on calculating this. Let's look at number 15, Graham's law. So Graham's law, says the rate of effusion of a gas is inversely proportional to the square root of the gas's molar mass. Now, that is a definition I do want you to understand. Uh, I did not ask you to perform calculations on the assignment that is due. I took off the only problem on there that was dealing with Graham's Law calculations. I want you to know the concept. So it is very much proportional to the mass of the gas, so it's inversely uh, proportional to the square root. So I'm not interested in doing that calculation, just understanding that the size of the molecule matters as far as how quickly it'll diffuse or if we diffuse, we'll talk about that here in a second. So that's Graham's law. Number 16, now we have diffusion. Diffusion is the tendency of molecules to move towards area of lower concentration until the concentration is uniform throughout. So high concentration to low concentration. So if I sprayed uh, air freshener on this side and it's gaseous state, it comes up, it is going to go from this high concentration area and diffuse all around the room until the it's dissipated. It's all over. So it went from high and spread out to low concentration. And that is the principle of diffusion. So if you talked about uh, an aerosol can, now you're dealing with uh, pressure as well, but if you had a can, let me just draw a can right here. We're gonna say this is an aerosol can here. And inside there is pressure right here at, at the, uh, at the top here, we have a lot of pressure and here we have this liquid and there's this uh, nozzle has a tube that runs down to here. So it's very similar to this, except when I press down on that nozzle, the gas inside is gonna come out because there is a difference in gas pressure there. So it's going to wanna equalize. So that's why it's forcing down to try and escape. So by forcing down, it is going to force the liquid or gas or whatever I might have in this out. And that's how an aerosol can works. Uh, whether it is a gas under pressure and you, you're equalizing the pressure by pressing the button and making it come out or you have a liquid in there, maybe paint or something like that. That's the principle of how that works. Effusion, the movement of gas molecules through tiny holes or pores in a container. That is what effusion is. And a balloon is a great example of that. A balloon loses helium. How does it get out? Well, there's pores in that uh, plastic rubberish uh, balloon mechanism and it can escape. So gases of smaller molar mass diffuse and effuse faster than gases of higher molar mass. And uh, with the same kinetic energy, that's a caveat there. So think about this and this formula here, you don't have to know the formula, just uh, I use it previously and that tells you why. So if they have the same kinetic energy and the mass is smaller, that means the velocity, the V component has to be a larger number. If you talk about a more massive number for mass, then V has to be smaller to have the same uh, kinetic energy. So that's the principle and the thought process behind that. And we did some, on our virtual lesson, I had some checkpoints on there. We had to determine which gas would diffuse or diffuse fastest. And what it is, is you selected the one with the smallest molar mass, which tells you it's a small molecule. So that is number 17. Number 18, what temperature units 
must be used in all gas formulas. It has to be Kelvin. Please do not forget that. It has to be Kelvin. So when you're using the regular gas laws and you're talking about uh, the, the volume, I just want to throw this one in here. If you're talking about the volume, the volume can be in milliliters except for the ideal gas law. It has to be in liters. So that is the only difference when it comes to volume, but temperature must always be in Kelvin. So please, please make sure you, you understand that. And number 19, I have it right there for you. Uh, Kelvin's is degrees Celsius plus 273. And then we have some pressures there, uh, which I told you we're not going to really mess so much with millimeters of mercury and core. But one atmosphere is 101.3 kilopascals. You should know that by now at this point. We've done a lot of work with that. Number 20, what is STP? Standard temperature and pressure. Standard temperature and pressure. And when you talk about a gas, the standard temperature for gas is zero degrees Celsius or 273 Kelvin. When you talk about the standard pressure for gas, it's one atmosphere or you could say it's 101.3 kilopascals. But when you actually see something say STP of a gas, it's zero degrees Celsius and one atmosphere, and then you convert to whatever else you might need. All right, number 21, be able to work any of these type of gas law problems. And I have uh, a number of them listed here, actually uh, eight of them to uh, break down and work with you. So what I would suggest is try and work on these and uh, pause the video and pick back up a little bit later on and see how did you do on these. So let's get started. So if a sample of gas has a volume of 100 milliliters when the pressure is 50 kilopascals, what is the volume when the pressure is increased to 400 kilopascals? Assume the temperature and number of moles are constant. So the temperature is constant. So I don't have to worry about that. So this is Boyle's law here. So I have P1 V1 equals P2 V2, real important. So always write down everything. Don't, don't cut a corner on that. So I'm gonna come over here, I'm gonna go pressure one, I have volume one, pressure two, volume two. So I have here, what if the sample of gas has a volume of 100 milliliters, so I'm gonna come here and I'm gonna go 100.0 milliliter. My pressure is 50.0 kilopascals. And it says, what is the volume when the pressure increased? So my volume here is mill, blank milliliters and my pressure is increased a lot. It goes to 400.0 kilopascals. So I'm solving for v, uh, V2. So I'm gonna come over here and I'm gonna divide both sides by P2 and I'm gonna get rid of it there. So now I'm gonna plug this in. Please keep track of your significant figures. It's really important. So I'm going to have 50.0 kilopascals. My volume one is 100.0 milliliters. And I'm going to divide that by my pressure two, which is 400.0 kilopascals. And kilopascals right here is going to cancel off. So uh, get my calculator out here. So I'm going to go 50.0 times 100 divided by 400. So I have three significant figures based on this right here. So three significant figures means I have gone down to my volume two equals 12.5 milliliters and that is my answer right there 12.5 milliliters all right so let's look at the next one here number two it says a soda bottle is flexible enough that the volume can change 
without opening. If you have an empty bottle with a two liter volume at room temperature, 25 degrees Celsius, what will be the new volume if put in the freezer, negative four uh, degrees Celsius? So being that it's flexible means that the pressure isn't going to change. All I'm worried about is the change in my volume. So I'm gonna come here and write this down. I have V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. And I told you on these, I like to just cross multiply right away. So I'm gonna go V1 over T2 equals V2 times T1, and that right here is what I'm gonna end up using. So I'm gonna come over here and write down everything. So I have V1, I have T1, I have V2, and I have T2. So it says here, I have volume is 2.0 liters, 2.0 liters. It says I have 25 degrees Celsius, 25 degrees Celsius plus 273 equals. So I have 298 Kelvins, 298 Kelvin. So now my volume two is what I'm searching for right here, blank liters. And it says my new uh, temperature is negative four degrees Celsius plus 273 equals 269 Kelvin, 69, 70, 73. So now I can, uh, solve for my volume two. So I'm going to divide both sides by T1 and get rid of it there. So V1, so I have 2.0 liters. T2 is 269 Kelvin. I'm going to divide by T1, which is 298 Kelvin. So my Kelvin's cancel, that leaves me liters. So now I plug this in. So I have 2.0 times 269 divided by 298. So I have, when I plug this in, I have two significant figures based on my 2.0 liters right there. So it comes out to one, one, 1.8 liters. So my temperature fell, so therefore my volume fell as well. So a uh, direct proportional, 1.8 liters. Now let's look at number three. A gas has a pressure of 0.370 atmospheres at uh, 50 degrees Celsius. What is the pressure at standard temperature? So here I have nothing to do with a volume. They're not giving me a volume. So when I look at this, this is Gay-Lussac's law. It's all about pressure and temperature. So I'm going to rewrite this over here. I'm going to go P1 over T1 equals P2 over T2. So I'm going to cross multiply. So I have P1 T2 equals P2 T1. So now let me write down all my information. So I have P1 T1 P2 T2. So my pressure is 0 0.370 atmospheres. 50 degrees Celsius, 50.0 degrees Celsius plus 273. So I have 323 Kelvin. My pressure two is what I'm solving for right here. And this is in atmospheres, ATMs. And then my temperature, it says uh, at standard temperature, which is zero degrees Celsius, plus 273 is 273 Kelvin. So I'm solving for P2. So I'm gonna come over here and divide both sides by T1, get rid of it, and that's my P2. So pressure one is 0 0.370 atmospheres. My temperature two is 273 Kelvin. 
And I'm going to divide that by my temperature one, which is 323 Kelvin, 323 Kelvin. So let me plug this in. So I got 0.370 times 273, and I'm going to divide that by 323. So when I look at my significant figures, I have three and uh, I have basically three sig figs. So I'm going to come over here and I'm going to go 0 0.313, 313 atmospheres. That will be my, that will be my pressure. So my pressure falls from 0 0.370 down to 0 0.313, and this is my answer. Number four, it says calculate the final pressure inside a scuba tank after it cools from 75 to 20 degrees Celsius. The initial pressure in the tank is 430 atmospheres. So, let me give myself a little bit more room here. So now let's uh, begin this here. So uh, it's a scuba tank, which is a rigid container, so the volume is not going to change here. So I have pressure one over temperature one equals pressure two over temperature two. So I'm going to go P1 T2 equals P2 T1. Now I'm going to write down all my information. So I have here. Pressure one, temperature one, pressure two, temperature two. Now come and fill this in. So the initial pressure, it says here is 430.0 atmospheres, ATM. My temperature one, it says it cools from 75. So this is at 75 degrees Celsius plus 273. So that's going to be, I do this right away. You may notice that already. I don't want to forget. And it's sometimes easier in a hurry. So 348 Kelvin. So 348 Kelvin. My pressure two uh, is what I'm solving for right here. So ATMs. And then my final temperature is going to be 20 degrees Celsius. 20 degrees Celsius plus 273 equals 70, 80, 90. So 293 Kelvin. So now I can come over here and solve. So I am going to divide both sides by T1 and get rid of it there. And that's my final pressure. So pressure one is 430. 0.0 atmospheres. My temperature one is 348 Kelvin. And I'm going to divide by, uh, I'm going to divide by the 348. I miswrote that. So temperature one is 348 48 Kelvin, and this here is your T2, which is 293. So please catch that, that I just corrected. So my Kelvins cancel off. So now that I have this written properly, so I have P1 and T2. So P1 is 430 times T2, which is 293. So I have 430 times 293, and I'm gonna divide that by 348. And now let's look at here at what I am uh, sig fig wise. So I have three significant figures based on the temperature. So I have uh, my P2 equals 362, 362, and this is atmospheres. So I can come right here, 362. So 362 based on my significant figures. So what happened is it cooled and it went from a higher temperature, the, temp the, uh, pressure, the pressure dropped as the temperature went from high to a lower temperature. All right, let's look at the next one. Number five, what will have to happen to the temperature of a sample of methane if 
1.5 liters at 98.5 kilopascals and 25 degrees Celsius is given a pressure of 108.5 kilopascals and a volume of 1.3 liters. So you may notice immediately, I got a lot of stuff going on here. So I'm gonna expand out a little bit here, give myself plenty of room. And this here, I'm seeing changing environment right away when I see that, I can just come here and write that. P1, V1, T1 equals P2, V2 over T2. And then I like to rewrite mine. I go P1, V1, T2 equals P2, V2, and T1. And that's a V right there. All right, so now I can write down all my information. So I have P1, V1, T1, P2, V2, and T2. So it says here, a uh, sample of methane, if 1.5 liters, so I have 1.5 liters at a pressure of 98.5 kilopascals and 25 degrees Celsius. 25 degrees Celsius plus 273 equals, and this is uh, 298 Kelvin. And it says uh, is given a pressure, and so now my pressure is going to be 108.5 kilopascals. My new volume is 1.3 liters. And now I'm solving here for Kelvins. And I can easily convert that once I get to the bottom of it. So I am solving for T2. So I'm gonna divide this all here by P1 V1, and that gets rid of that. So let's write this all down here. So I have P2, right there, P2. So I have 108. 0.5 kilopascals. I have V2, which is 1.3 liters. I have T1, which is 298 Kelvin. I'm going to divide that by P1, which is 98.5 kilopascals, and my V1, which is 1.5 liters, 1.5 liters. So let me get rid of my kilopascals, get rid of my liters right here, and now I can plug this into the calculator. So I have 108.5 times 1.3 times 298 divided by 98.5 times 1.5 and equals. So now I have to be at two significant figures based on my volume here and here. So two sig figs. So when I look at this right here, I have to round to 200 and 80, 280. So my temperature two equals 280 Kelvin. If I want to know that in, in uh, Celsius, so 280 minus 273 is is seven degrees Celsius. So I can circle that right there. And, and we're dealing with uh, two, two significant figures, 7.0 degrees Celsius, 7.0 degrees Celsius. Okay. All right, let's look at the next one here. So number six, how many moles of gas are in 35 
liter scuba cam canister if the temperature of the canister is 310 Kelvin and the pressure uh, is 265 atmospheres. So now we're dealing with moles. How many moles? So that right away tells me it is my ideal gas law. So PV equals NRT. So it says how many moles? So I'm just going to divide it right away. So I'm going to go R and T and get rid of it from there. And that kicks my moles. So now let me, let me write down all my information. P, I have V, I have R, I have T, and N is what I'm solving for, blank moles. So how many moles of gas are in 35 liters? So I have here, volume is 35 liters. Uh, and it says the pressure is 265 ATMs, atmospheres, and the temperature is 310 Kelvin. So right away at atmospheres, I know my R value is 0 0.0821. So now I'm gonna come over here and plug this in. So I have 265 atmospheres. My volume is 35 liters. Divide by my R, 0 0.0821. It has a bunch of units with it, but they cancel off. And then my temperature is 310 Kelvin. So that at the uh, 0 0.0821 is going to be, uh, moles, kelvins over uh, liters and ATMs. And that's how I get to that by them canceling off. And now I can solve for my moles here. So I have 265 times 35 liters. Divide that by 0 0.0821 times 310. All right, so I have uh, to have two significant figures. So I have 300, N equals 360 moles of gas. So it's under a lot of pressure, so I was able to put a lot of moles inside of this canister. So N equals 360 moles based on the two sig figs. All right, let's go down here to number uh, seven. So we have just a couple more uh, problems left here, give us a little more space. What is the total pressure in a tank that contains oxygen, nitrogen, helium, if the partial pressures of each are as follows? So I have partial pressure is 20.0 kilopascals, partial pressure is 46.7 kilopascals, and partial pressure is 26.7 kilopascals. So I know that according to Dalton's law of partial pressure, my pressure total equals the pressure partial of O2 plus the pressure partial of N2 plus the pressure partial of helium. And I have it all right here. So I have 20.0 kilopascals plus 46.7 kilopascals plus 26.7 kilopascal. So let me get my calculator and I'll get this all calculated here. So I have 20.0 plus 46.7 plus 26.7. So uh, rules of significant figures, I cannot have more decimal places than the least number of decimal places because this is addition. So I can't go past the tenths position. So I have the pressure total equals 93.4 kilopascals. And that is my answer. Let's look at the last one, number eight. What is the partial pressure of oxygen if the total pressure uh, in a rigid tank is 325 atmospheres? So my pressure totals, pressure equals 325 atmospheres. 
There is also nitrogen in the tank as well as helium. So what is the partial pressure of oxygen at the total? So I am trying to find, there's three gases in here. So I have partial pressure of oxygen equals, and I don't know what that is. That's what it's asking me for right here. It says I have pressure of nitrogen, and that is in the tank, and the partial pressure of helium is in the tank. So there is also nitrogen in the tank as well as helium with the pressure of 75 atmospheres. So here I have 75 atmospheres for nitrogen, and helium is 110, and there's a point there saying I have three sig figs on this one atmospheres. So I know what the total is, 325 atmospheres. So I want to calculate what is my uh, pressure of oxygen. So my pressure, just by understanding this is all added together. So my partial pressure of oxygen is going to equal my pressure total minus parentheses the partial pressure of nitrogen plus the partial pressure of helium. So my pressure total here is 325 minus, I have 75 plus 110. So let me get my calculator. So 325 minus 75 plus 110. So that means the partial pressure of oxygen is going to equal 140 uh, atmospheres. And I can circle that. But you want to check if you're right, you add all three gases. So you go 140 plus 110 plus 75, and that equals the 325, which is what I began with. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for watching. I hope this uh, video uh, lesson was helpful. We went through a number of problems. Hopefully you pause the video and work through them. Uh, and we'll meet briefly on Tuesday with a live Zoom for those who would like to, to pop on. So thank you for watching. Go in peace. Enjoy your day.